Sell with the best. Harrisburg. Five of the last six horses of the year selling as yearlings were sold at Harrisburg. Last year's yearling sale was an all-time record breaker. Find your champion. November 6th through the 10th. Windback Farm of Delaware is proud to introduce O'Brien and Ushua Board winner Southwind Frank to its lineup in 2023. The farm is already home to Triple Crown winner and Dan Patch winner and Horse of the Year Glidemaster, Ushua Award winner and Meadowlands Pace winner He's Watching, Battle of Waterloo winner with a mark of 149 and one sports column, and Yonkers Trot winner with earnings near $1 million top flight angel. Also standing at Windback of Delaware, Badlands Hanover, Classic Card Shark, and Roddy's Bags again. For more information and a complete lineup, visit windbackfarm.com. John, we catch up with you frequently here in Florida. This year we've decided to change the scenery. We moved from your barn to the viewing deck. Uh, beautiful weather today. This has to be one of the reasons why you choose to keep coming back year after year. Oh, definitely. Um, it's just it's a big plus for us and it's a big plus for the horses. And as long as the economics work and when we're paying stall rent in Pennsylvania and how everything goes, the feed is the same down here is what we pay up north. Uh, when you prorate everything out, stall rent here compared to there, we use uh, J.R. Hudson's and uh, ship the horses down here on their semis. It's economically, it works, you know, so if it's gonna be a wash where you wanna train at, why not train here? Well, we've got to catch up with you the last two years. This year, is there anything different in your routine? Has the plan changed at all, or are you kinda in a, it's not broke, don't fix it? Uh, as far as the training and stuff goes, the methodology is probably pretty similar to what I've always had. The only changes would be is we do have a few more Kentucky dual eligible horses. And this year I purchased six Indiana breads to go along with the two three-year-olds. So I'll probably have a division of horses out in Indiana. So I'm just a big fan of how their program is right now. And eventually if we do decide to leave the East Coast and let my son take care of that or one of the other people that work for me, I'll settle back to the Midwest and get out of the rat race. <laughs> That's one thing. When you look down at the training rosters uh, for several different trainers here in Florida, they stick to their area. They stick to a specific program. You're all over with horses all over different places. Um, how do you move your stable? Are you stabled at different places? It has to be a, a great asset to have great people, caretakers, trainers. That, that That's the key to it is caretakers and, and trainers and people that you can rely on and trust. Uh, the last several years when we've gone, or for quite a few years when we go to Kentucky, usually my son will go or we'll flip-flop around with some other people and pick up someone down there. So this year will be one new little wrinkle that we would have with the Indiana program as far as how we're going to set it up. I've got a married couple here that have been working for me this winter, and we'll probably try to set them up out there here once things get rolling along and see how, the, see how it shakes out. Last year it kind of worked out okay when we dipped our toe in the water a little bit. Okay, let's jump into your horses. You have the first crop of Captain Crunch. You have two of them starting off with Waterloo, $33,000 Harrisburg purchase out of Rose Ruthless. I had a chance to check him out in the stall. He's gorgeous. How did you get him at the discount? Yeah, I don't know. He's a big, good looking horse. So I wasn't really looking um, for Pacers or for Captain Crunches per se. Yes, I've seen him at Bucare's consignment. Um, and as I do, I'll sit around and I'll watch horses and have the marks on them. Um, the price take was right. You know, I, would, I'd, I'd, I like him. He's a big, strong colt. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the Captain Crunches do. You know, the mayor's a good mayor, 100% uh, producer, I believe. So we got a shot anyhow. Crunched the numbers, a $35,000 Lexington purchase, a colt out of ingenious style. Tell me a little bit about that colt. Also the same thing, I had uh, gone out, we looked at all the horses at Kentuckiana and he, would, he fit the bill of how I like a horse to look. Turned him out, I liked how he moved in the field, good video. And the same thing, the price was right and I thought it would be in a uh, 
being dual eligible had some attraction to it. And at the right price and a decent mare, I thought we'd give it a shot. So. Windex Willie is one of the ones on your list. It's a help is on the way from the Hoosier sale, 37000 already listed as a gelding. Did you purchase the horse that way? Yeah, we bought, uh, I bought six in Indiana this year, ended up with all six trotting colts. So it wasn't by design. Four of the six were already castration, so that saved me a couple hundred bucks right off the get-go and not have to worry about it. And the other two subsequently, once they got down here, they were gelded as well. But uh, that, that's not uncommon in Indiana to see quite a few of them that are already castrated before they go to the sale. So, and it don't bother me to buy a gelding. It, they're fine. And he's a he's a colt that um, Jim Crawford really loved his video on after Lexington was over. Irv Miller, myself, and uh, Tom Simmons went to a bunch of the different farms and looked at the horses. And he's a very striking, pretty colt. Uh, had luck with the help is on the ways. So, uh, you know, like I said, trying to look at the program in Indiana and it looks like a good spot and you can uh, get decent horses for reasonable prices and up and down the ladder, regardless if you have a top colt or not a top colt, I think the way they have their program set up, it gives everybody a chance to at least get your money back out. And that's, that's important, you know, because you're not always going to, we're going to make mistakes and we're not always going to buy the right horses or what, but even if you get a horse to the races and you get a chance to win a race or two, it makes everybody feel good and put a little money on their card and then you can keep them or move them along and try again. Reggie Anito was sold as pure tact. What is the story behind the name change there? I'm not quite certain. Uh, the owner just called me oh, a couple of weeks ago and told me, well, we got the name changes. Reggie Anito, and we're calling him Little Reggie or something, I think is what his nickname <laughs> will be. Um, but yeah, he's just kind of a nice colt. We had luck. It's uh, Leonard Berg and his brother Jeff, and then another fellow, Rich Preziati, uh, took a percentage of them. We had luck last year with Purple Lord, who had a real good year for us, being the first crop of Tactical Landing. And he was kind of looking for maybe another son of Tactical Landing. And it got later into the sale, and we didn't have to pay a whole lot for him. And he's just a, just a nice little colt. He goes out and trots along, does everything right. So we'll see. Moving on to one they made you pay big money for, Border Wall, a Walner out of Century Empress, 125000 yeah, actually, um, it's M&L of Delaware along with Alabama Associates, some new uh, friends of theirs that are just last year was their first year in. This is their second year buying some yearlings. Uh, and they bought, I had looked at them prior to it. They bought them and I was in the back ring at Lexington and they handed me a ticket and said, here, we'd like you to train this colt. And I was like, yeah, am I going to say no to a $125,000 Walner colt? No, he's a good, he's a big, good looking colt. Uh, the dual eligibility is going to help him. We're going to probably keep him on the bigger racetracks. And if we get a little bit later start, we trained him in 2.30 here the other day, I think it was. And just a real big, strong colt, good going colt. So we're going to take our time with him. Uh, they put a lot of money into him. They staked him up pretty good for the, everything this year and, you know, target towards the end of the year. As we're talking about Border Wall, I noticed on his equipment card that he has trotting hobbles. Is that something that's recently been added? And how do you utilize those in your program? Yeah, we just put them on here about two weeks ago or so. I talked to the owners and said, you know, I'm going to throw some trotting hobbles on them. Uh, going the slow miles, he's fine. But when we try to brush him along a little bit at times, he may shy from something. He may see something, put in a step, touch himself, whatever. Um, so I'll throw trotting hobbles on a horse for a, a training trip, two or three. And if it seems like they uh, help them gain their confidence, we'll keep them on for a while. And then ultimately, we'll start taking them off again. The one you put the trot on was looked great the first trot. Yeah, he's a, he's a nice colt with another uh, training trip or two. I'll train him without him, at least the first trip, and make sure he's okay. But I think it's just a little bit of confidence builder, you know, like I said in our interview earlier. Same with the Murphy blind. Sometimes a horse will get in a habit of running in on the turns. You know, you can slap a Murphy blind on him for a training trip or two and get around the turns. They just kind of want to cheat on you sometimes. I think you can take it off and it will straighten up quite often. A lot of times you're trying things, things work, things don't, you're going back to the drawing board. I mean, it really is a lot of trial and error. Mm-hmm. I uh, find yourself a lot of times maybe we just keep adding and adding. Uh, several times on several of these horses this year, I just said, okay, we're stopping, we're going back to ground one and just go out plain happy bridle, no overcheck, no yeah. head pulls, no, you know, don't shoe them any special. You got one that's a little trouble. 
just go barefoot. I mean, I got a, a colt here now that I've gone barefoot for the last 10 days, and every day now it's just better and better and better. Took the overcheck off him, just wow. letting him go along. So kind of, you know, we started out good, started going a little bit one direction on us. We started changing some things, and every time I changed him, he didn't really improve him. Before I knew it, he was pissed, I was pissed. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Yeah. You know, it we'll really is true. At. You got to get him back to being happy, don't yeah. you think? I mean, that's. So it just kind of backed off him. You know, he gets a lot of time out in the field and went right back to square one with him and see where we're going to end up at. So. Great. So, what about shoeing? Do you put them on as soon as they get down here? This surface is pretty soft and forgiving. Nice. Yeah, we can get away without shoeing them right away. When the babies come down, I'll uh, pull their tail plates off of them if they haven't been taken off. We'll go with them three, four, five days. And it kind of depends on when I'm around and when the blacksmith's around or what they're doing. Moving on to the fairer sex, City of the Stars, a Philly, $47,000 Lexington purchase, a courtly choice out of Western City. Yeah, uh, it wasn't, I looked at some courtly choices at the Goshen sale and they were good, real good looking horses. Uh, this some Philly here, her dam is just, she's a stellar pro producer. I mean, everything out of the mare. Uh, Again, the one where uh, Leonard Bergen taken a look at the horse and was happy with how she looked, and uh, they were they wanted to give her a shot. You know, the New York program is a good program, and we'll see what the what Courtly Choice brings to the table. So, uh, a twelve thousand uh, dollar crazy wild purchase, Carolina Solveig. Looking for some crazy wilds. Uh, ended up with two fillies, one at Goshen, one Lexington. This filly was late in the sale. Uh, she was one of only two horses in the sale that didn't have videos. Um, they both came from the same uh, same breeder. Um, electric confirmation, and uh, I think I may have kept her price down. I mean, she's a sister to a couple half million dollar winners, um, and she's doing everything right right now. So even at uh, at that price point, um, looks like Crazy Wilds are going to be okay for the New York program. If they trot, they're going to make money, and I think that's what we got. John, you have a large stable down here with a lot of different quality individuals. We ask you to narrow it down to between five and seven, but um, how do you know when staking time comes? Who are the ones by name that you have put the big money on? And uh, is it too early to kind of determine that? It's very early to determine it. It's a, you know, I would really like to see the stake program revamped some way, shape, or form. I know everybody talks about it, but it's an antiquated system that was designed around the Grand Circuit when you knew where, what race was going to be raced at what track on what day. I mean, when I worked for Delvin Miller, we left the Meadowlands after Hambo, went to spend a week at the Meadows for Adios Week. From there, we went to Springfield. From Springfield, we went to Indianapolis. Indianapolis, we went to Ducoin. A lot of stables were shipped to Lexington to go up to Delaware uh, and Scioto for some races, and then down to Lexington, and it was all over. So it, it, um, it was easier to stake to what you knew to stake to. So now... The way, I mean, the, pro, the, the system is still the same, but you're making payments in March for three-year-old races, and you don't even know where they're going to be raced at, when they're going to be raced at, what it's going to conflict. So I think, uh, I think the stakes could benefit from a change. But the difference between a horse, like we talked about the two Captain Crunches there, and I, I singled them out because they were first crop studs, and I singled out the Courtly Choice Philly was why I picked them for, for you guys. Um, if they pace in 52, they might win a maiden. If they pace in 51, they're going to win a stallion series. If they pace in 50, they're going to win a sire stakes. And if they pace in 49, you probably got a grand circuit performer. For me, training these things between 225 and 230 right now and tell you which ones are going to pace in 49 or 52, and that's the minute difference between a good horse or a bad horse. So when I make the decisions, I pay all their sire stakes. I mean, the sire stakes programs have really changed everything, and there's a lot of money to be made. And then we fill in the gaps. Uh, if there's a gap in their schedule, then we can uh, pick a race here or there. And then you look, same thing. You look at their gait. You look at their attitude. Look at the pedigree. I mean, if I Carolina Solvay was a twelve thousand dollar crazy wild, am I going to drop uh, twenty thousand in staking on her? No, probably not. You know, I'm, we're going to pay her into New York, maybe pick a race or two here or there in kindergarten, and if she turns out okay, let her pay her way, let her stake herself next year as a three year old. So I always look at sire stake programs first, fill in the gaps afterwards, and then we just a guessing game. So the Walner Colt then I would assume would be the highest staked in the barn, or is there another name out there? 
Uh, there's several Walner Colts, and I also didn't pick a couple that I think are really good because I don't want to jinx them because I was told by my wife that I shouldn't do any more interviews after last year when the ones I picked didn't turn out. So there, there's a couple horses that you don't know about that I'm not telling you about. So we'll leave yes, it Yes, <laughs> I love that. So, yes, yeah, so we're getting a small sampling of John Boot and Shane Sable walking through your stable. It looked amazing. John, thank you so much for once again always being so willing to take time and talk to us at Harness Racing Up. Update. Oh, you're quite welcome.